Hi, I'm Dr. Pologi. This is my blog. I'd like to share a trivial story. At least it's going to sound that way. It'll pay off at the end, but bear with, but bear with me as it starts small. A patient I'm going to call Elaine was reaching across the dinner table to cut meat for her young son's dinner, and the family was chatting about things and gradually reminiscing about similar scenes in her own childhood, and she gradually ended up revealing to her family that, in her memory, nobody cut her meat. She would sit there staring at the slab of steak, and she told this like it was a joke. And her husband was kind of surprised and said, nobody cut the meat for you? Now, when Elaine told me the story, we had been working together for about two years, and she suddenly became sad, and she was silent for a moment, and then she realized that although she had vaguely always recalled the image she described, uh, that she described her family. For some reason, her husband's question brought back the rest of the memory. Uh, she suddenly could remember staring at the meat, feeling helpless, hopeless, and usually just giving up. And in her memory anyway, sitting there and not eating. And nobody around seemed to notice. Um, when she told me the story, I began to ask for, to fill in some of the details. Where was, where was her parents? Where were both of them at the table? Uh, this is a repeated scene. Did it ever happen at the grandparents' home? Where were her siblings? And she became more and more sad as she realized that, to the best of her recollection, nothing happened. Nobody reached out. Nobody even noticed. And she sat there in some sort of profound misery, which she had always kind of forgotten. Uh, certainly left out of the story when she told it at cocktail parties as a joke. Um, Elaine was remembering the barest outline of this story, uh, just the facts, none of the pain. Now, this is a common, <clears throat> excuse me, a common defense, which is called isolation. It's seen in particular in people who have a tendency to obsess, uh, to intellectualize, to worry, uh, people who have anxiety symptoms, who rationalize. You can find some more dramatic examples of it in the written blog that's attached to my main website, which is um, aboutpsychotherapy.com. Um, but I don't want to take the time to get into more examples here. In any case, why is all this important? Why am I telling you this steak story? Well, it turns out Elaine came to see me with a long history of anxiety, night terrors, waking up in a, in a cold sweat but not remembering any particular dreams. Um, sorry, I'm reading notes off the screen, uh, so excuse me when my eyes go up and down. Um, a growing uh, estrangement from and irritation with her husband uh, and uh, despite her great success as a businesswoman, she was a, a consultant who ran her own, at this point, ran a, virtually ran her own business. She had partners and was brought in as sort of the resident expert. And she was finding it harder and harder to assert when she needed to. She was very quickly sort of sagging in on herself, feeling hopeless and helpless and um, becoming silent just when she needed to work. Now, you may begin to suspect, I hope you are. A connection between this stake story and these symptoms. So bear with me. Uh, where was I? So these problems had plagued her much of her life, and they had grown. And she came to see me when she was in about to, she was in her mid thirties. Uh, at various times over the years, she was able to keep these problems at bay. Um, during the high twenties, in her twenties, uh, when things were going very well for her, and life was only sort of steady climb up the hill and her re growing relationship with the man who became her husband, um, she was distracted from all these problems, and they were much more minimal, although they were there. In any case, she came in in her mid-30s, which is quite common. That's often when people's earlier defenses begin to fail them, and that's when they seek help. Um, so uh, during the couple of years that, that we had already worked together, we made slow, steady progress with all of those problems. She gradually became more appropriately assertive when she needed to be. Um, excuse me, I think I left something out. No, I didn't. Um, and um, she was uh, able to handle better her three young children, including one who had some disabilities and required extra patience and uh, attention. And she gradually began sleeping better. So then came the session when she told me this uh, <clears throat> steak story. And it was here that her relationship with her husband and her handling of her business associates and her family and clients um, took a rather dramatic turn. She had complained to me in this same session that we, she told me the story about the dinner times as a child. 
about a um, particular client who came to her with a, a naive but reasonable request, something that was common in, in laymen, uh, in, in new clients before they had begun to work with her. But as she talked about this one client in particular, for whatever reason, he pushed a button and she became furious and disgusted and sour and uh, had that inner sagging and feeling of helplessness. She covered it up in the meeting, but that's how she felt. And she compared this guy to, in her words, those idiots who don't vaccinate their kids. It's not my words, hers. Uh, and I'm, you know, I asked her, well, why? This is the kind of client she told me about before. What, what, why was this guy pushing her buttons? Um, I also commented that this sounded familiar to what she experienced with her husband. I remember uh, she had come to me complaining uh, of problems in her marriage. In fact, those were the ones that really uh, gave her the final push to, to seek help. She would describe a feeling of deep irritation and deep hopelessness to work out even the most minor negotiations with her husband, um, who would pick something up from the store on the way home from work. Um, as we discussed him, though, excuse me, it became very quickly clear that this guy was not at all the typical unreasonable spouse I hear about. He was, in fact, agreeable, affable, uh, not particularly demanding or difficult. But she would quickly sink into this grumpy, silent helplessness at the merest resistance from, uh, from him or just input from him. Um, he had learned to sort of ignore it. and He'd stopped asking, honey, what's wrong? And kind of let her go away and let, let the mood recover. And then they'd, they'd get back together. But it wasn't working out and she was getting more unhappy. And so was he. So in response to my questions, Elaine answered that yes, uh, the feeling with this client, <coughs> excuse me, <clears throat> was uh, very similar to the one she felt towards uh, those people who don't vaccinate, the same as she felt towards her husband. Now, on something of a role in the session at this point, she kind of got excited by these connections, and her speech accelerated in pace and energy, and she acknowledged similar feelings when her four-year-old daughter wasn't being attentive or was cranky, um, or even if somebody spoke, excuse me, a bit forcefully or just enthusiastically at the meeting of her local tennis association, a, a particularly low-stress uh, experience for her. But even there, that same sag was starting to happen, that inner sag, and heaviness, and sense of hopelessness, depression. Now, what has all this got to do with steak? Well, I hope you're already beginning to sense it. I suggested that these, these experiences in all these different places sounded a lot like what she must have experienced in reality, sitting at the table at age four or five, unable to figure out how to, how to approach her steak and feeling a sense of hopelessness and believing that nobody was noticing her, nobody would help, nobody had even any interest in what she was going through or even noticed her predicament. And then came one of those moments that we therapists live for. Uh, the rapid speech stopped, her face softened, she looked sorrowful for a moment, her eyes glistened with tears, and she became much more expressive, uh, more emotional in her speech, and out came a flood of associations, memories and ideas, uh, from past and present, in which um, so much of her life, her difficult moments, her symptoms, the various places that she had problems, all began to make sense to her as enactments of that scene at the dinner table and similar experiences from those early days. Now, you might be thinking, that's great. What a great story. The therapist had a good time. Maybe the patient did as well. Why is it important? What's the value of that? Well. This all matters because of the change I saw in Elaine, we saw in Elaine. During the session, being immediately, let me say this clearer. It's important because the change I saw in the session was immediately echoed in changes in her behavior and her feelings outside the session. Um, hang on a second. Sorry. Very quickly, her, um, her functioning was different. The pushy people at meetings suddenly lost their threatening quality because she was no longer rocketed, unconsciously, of course, but rocketed back into those early experiences by whatever was happening in the present. Suddenly, she simply lived in the present, and the people being a little enthusiastic or even pushy were not a threat, and they weren't important, and she handled them as she had handled thousands of others.
Remember, this was a very accomplished woman. Uh, her husband ceased to be this, uh, not exactly a monster, but, but sort of a potential monster, somebody that she deep down felt she dreaded to speak up to. He just became a guy that, like any other man, and somebody that she could talk to. And again, because she stopped this unconscious reliving of the past, um, she began to rather quickly, easily, naturally just answer him when he said, oh, could you pick that thing up at the store? I, I got to work late. Or could you call the insurance company? And she started saying, well, you already started with them. Why don't you call them? And he said, okay. Or he'd say, well, they really pissed me off and I got to make three other calls today. Do you mind doing it? And then she'd go, all right. And it wasn't so loaded anymore for her. Um, they even became rather loving and playful about the whole thing and their relationship recovered. Uh, she was startled, she told me, to find out how reasonable he actually was. <laughs> she had been reacting to him as if he was quite a different person than who he really was. I actually met him a year or two later, and sure enough, she was, as he described him, quite affable. Um, so what we see here is a um, demonstration of two great truths of psychotherapy and of life. And th these truths in include the promise, the only promise that I can make to a patient. Uh, and it's a powerful promise. The, truth, truth, the two truths are these. What we don't feel, what we don't remember, we're doomed to reenact. What we don't feel or remember, we're doomed to reenact. Um, out in the real world, they say those who are ignorant of history are doomed to repeat it. Um, and the second thing is that when we do remember, when we do feel those forgotten, pushed away, avoided experiences, we feel better and we do better. Let me say it again. When we do remember and feel those experiences we've been pushing away with forgetting, with isolation, with defenses, with symptoms, when we re-experience all that stuff, we feel better and we do better. That's the magic. And I've seen it across all kinds of patients. I've been doing this work about 30 years. God. <laughs> and I've seen it in all kinds of patients. Uh, kids, adults, all ages, all economic, socioeconomic uh, levels, all educational levels, any race, any religion, bright people, not bright people, um, angry people, timid people. It works with everyone. And it is, with very few exceptions, what all psychotherapy is about. The few exceptions are some of the behavioral treatments, things like EMDR, um, exposure and response prevention, one or two others. Other than that, all the therapies you're likely to run across or experience are going to have that, ex that phenomenon at their core. So thank you for your attention. Again, please read more on the blog. Uh, and the full website, which is aboutpsychotherapy.com. And of course, take a look at my book, which just came out. It's called Stop Lying, Getting Unlost and Unstuck in Your Life. I hope I got that right. I wrote the damn thing. Thank you, and I'll see you next week.